Thank you very much. Oh, my goodness. Well, what a lovely welcome. Thank you guys very, very much, all of you that came out in person and the potentially millions who are watching live online right now. It could even be into the billions, potentially. We're just not sure. But welcome. So today we're going to talk about selections in Photoshop, which is always a, sort of an interesting topic because in a lot of respects when you're making selections, you're accomplishing absolutely nothing. Because a selection all by itself is just one piece of a puzzle. And generally, that involves one of two things. So you're either creating composite images. How many love creating all sorts of fanciful, wild, incredible composite images? Or applying a targeted adjustment. So an adjustment that affects only a specific area of the image. So maybe I want to get more contrast and detail and drama in just the sky and not in the foreground, or whatever the case might be. The way I think of this is generally, I look at a photo. I'm happy with it overall, except for one little area of the image. And there are a variety of ways that we can go about employing what are referred to in Photoshop as layer masks, the stencil, if you will, that identifies where an adjustment will affect the image or where an image will actually be visible in the case of a composite. More often than not, though, I find that I want to use a selection as the basis of my targeted adjustment, for example, the basis of my layer mask. And so today we're going to talk about favorite selection techniques. I could go on probably for several days talking about selections in Photoshop, but we don't have several days. And so we're just going to talk about essentially my favorite techniques, kind of the things that I do on a regular basis in the context of selections in Photoshop. I should hasten to add that they are my favorite selection techniques. So you might find that there are other techniques, other tools that you like that I don't tend to use all that much, or there are some methods that I use that you don't care for, and that's all well and good. But today, I get to talk about my personal favorites. So first off, uh, some disclaimers. Well, I mentioned the part where they're my favorite techniques. They might not necessarily be your favorite techniques. But also, there's a couple other things. Uh, number one, there are situations where selections are just plain difficult. And ladies and gentlemen, it is tremendously stressful being here in front of a live audience, potentially having millions of people watching live online. It's very intimidating. And so I'm also going to try to work relatively quickly. I don't want to take the extra time to do a perfect job with every single selection I'm going to create. And of course, my adjustments will often be a little bit on the exaggerated side so that it's easier for you to see exactly what's going on when I demonstrate some of these concepts using an adjustment. So here, for example, I have a paraglider flying over the beautiful landscape of the Palouse region of eastern Washington state. Ladies and gentlemen, today I will not be selecting all of those little strings that are holding that <laughs> gentleman down below his wing there. Uh, so bear in mind that when we're applying targeted adjustments, when we're creating composite images, we need to be a little bit realistic. I'll give you another example of that momentarily. But just bear in mind, I'm giving you a lot of concepts and techniques and tools that you can use. I'm not going to take the extra time to make everything perfect. I'm going to work kind of quickly so that you can understand those basic concepts. And speaking of basic concepts, what is a selection after all? Or what is a layer mask? Or what is an alpha channel? If you've heard one of those, what's quick mask mode? What other words could we use to describe all of these things? A saved selection, a selection that you can load. They're all the same thing. Layer mask, selection, alpha channel, quick mask mode, all of these are exactly the same thing as far as I'm concerned. They're just used in a different context. And this can be made a lot easier if you just think of the concept of a stencil. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to demonstrate for you my amazing drawing skills. Once I demonstrate my drawing skills, you will qu quickly realize why I became a photographer instead of a painter or a sketch artist. But I just want to illustrate the basic concept. Now, don't worry about exactly what I'm doing. This is just kind of a theoretical concept. But I'm going to choose a brush tool, and I'm going to choose a color, and I'm going to cause myself a tremendous amount of stress trying to paint along, oh boy, along the lines. This is not something that I've ever been good at, and now I have the added stress of all of you and potentially millions at home watching as I make a fool of myself with my really bad drawing ability. What do you say? Better than mine. It, better than yours. <laughs> All right, so here I have painted white. And to make things a little bit easier on myself, I'm going to use a handful of keyboard shortcuts and fill the opposite area with black. And there you have it. 
a selection. Is it actually a selection? No. But this is essentially what Photoshop thinks of when it comes to a selection or a layer mask or quick mask mode or an alpha channel or a saved selection. Again, many of those are exactly the same thing. It is just a way for Photoshop to identify an area. And so in the context of a selection, that's what a selection looks like in the background to Photoshop. We'll see some evidence of that a little bit later. But that's a stencil where white is selected and black is not selected. And so if you think about a selection as a stencil, I think that all of these concepts become a lot easier to understand and hopefully a lot less intimidating. Anybody ever been intimidated by selections? Not me. I mean, me too. I mean, not me. So this is essentially a selection. And of course, I could create a selection for real based on that. So there is, OK, a not very accurate selection. But I mentioned how bad my drawing skills are. Plus, there's all this added pressure here. But a selection is literally just a stencil where Photoshop is identifying a particular area of the image. And so we can use a variety of tools to say, please select the sky. Or more to the point, my ultimate goal is, please apply an adjustment to the sky without affecting the Adobe building. Or please affect the Adobe building without affecting the sky. And so you can imagine a world, ladies and gentlemen, where, in fact, we can just look into the exterior here of the event space, into the B&H photo store, the superstore, and see people playing these virtual reality games, which is pretty incredible. So someday, Photoshop will most likely have this technology, right? Where we can literally, we'll probably have on those funny goggles and look a little foolish, a little goofy, and we'll just be looking around at our photo in three dimensions. And we can say, Photoshop, please darken the sky by one half of a stop. And Photoshop will understand what the sky is and how to select it and make it all perfect and darken by you know, half a stop or what have you. In the meantime, we have a little bit of manual work that we need to do. But that's half the fun, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's Fallon. <laughs> Fallon hangs out there in the Palouse, right outside the town of Palouse, as it would turn out, in eastern Washington state. So let's assume that we're going to create a selection. And in fact, once again, don't worry about exactly what I'm doing to create this selection. I'm just going to, oh, we'll expand that selection a little bit and expand the range of color values. And let's call that good enough. So I've made a selection by mysterious methods that we'll take a look at a little bit later today. And what do we have here? Well, we have an animated line. OK, we have a jumble of animated dashes all over the place throughout the image. That is a difficult selection to comprehend, isn't it? Uh, this outline, by the way, is often referred to as the marching ants. Let's start with a simpler selection. There we go, a little rectangle, or a, roughly a square, very nearly a square. And now it becomes a little more clear why the selection outline is often referred to as marching ants, because it kind of looks like ants, a column of ants making their way toward a picnic somewhere. And so we have this animated dashed line that identifies what is selected and what is not, except it's actually not quite that simple. Because this animated line, it's an outline. When it's just a rectangular selection, it's so simple. It's a rectangle, and inside that rectangular shape is selected. Outside is not selected. What's selected here? I don't know. But if we use that selection for some purpose, I'll just go ahead and create a silly hue saturation adjustment. Now it's a purple barn and purple Fallon instead of a red barn, and kind of a brownish, reddish Fallon. Well, if we take a look at the product of our selection there, this happens to be a layer mask. But again, don't worry about the technicalities of that. This is what the selection looks like to Photoshop. It's my stencil. And so what did I select? Well, I selected the red boards, but not the dark shadows in between each board. And I partially selected the interior of the barn where there's a little red. And you know that, what would you call that color? Well, not that color, but the original color of the horse is something like a reddish brown, what would you call that, chestnut maybe? That's what I'm going to call it. So I have areas that are selected. So remember, the selection is just a stencil. White is selected, black is not selected. But notice also that I have shades of gray. And this creates a challenge for us, because if we reload the selection and you compare where the marching ants are to 
where the selection actually is. Let's zoom in on the main here. And notice where the selection outline, the marching ants, actually falls. I originally defined this selection as a stencil, where white is selected and black is not selected. And so obviously, the marching ants line will define the transition from black to white. Things get a lot more messy when we have all these shades of gray. I have areas that are partially selected. And so it's important to keep in mind that the selection outline does not necessarily precisely define the shape of your selection. Because areas that are 25% selected will essentially appear not to be selected. And areas that are only 75% selected will appear to be completely selected. You're only seeing the line that defines greater than versus less than 50% selected. So if we're talking about a very clear, distinct subject that we've selected, it might be 100% selected versus 0% selected. But more often than not, we're probably going to run into situations where we have partial selection. And what that really translates into is affect this area completely, the selected areas, affect this area not at all, the areas that are not selected, and the areas that are shades of gray in this context, partially selected, they will get part of the adjustment. So we might have an adjustment that darkens the image by one stop. Some areas get darkened by one stop. Some areas don't get darkened at all. But some of the partially selected areas might get darkened by just half a stop, for example. All righty. We also need to have realistic expectations. How many of you are amazingly talented when it comes to creating selections? <laughs> How many of you think you're halfway decent, not too bad, but don't want to you know, get too excited about it? Claim to be too good. Just basically modest, right? Humble. Well, there's some challenges. There are situations where we're simply not going to be able to create a perfect selection, or where we're able to create a perfect selection, but it still doesn't quite give us what we need. So let's just assume that somewhere around there is nearly perfect. I'm going to create a selection here. And again, don't worry about the specific technique being used here. I'm just kind of cleaning this up just a little bit. And we'll pretend like I did an absolutely perfect job. So now I've selected the flower. I want to select the inverse. And let's just go with an extreme version here. I'm going to make a black and white interpretation of the photo. And if we take a look at this area up in here, we have this very obvious halo. So the flower has been converted, well, it's been left as color rather than black and white. And the exterior, everything outside of the flower has been converted to black and white. But we have this little halo. Well, obviously, it means I didn't create a perfect selection. So I just need to go in there and clean things up manually. And so if I use my brush tool, I want to essentially reveal this adjustment in the area that was missed. And so if I come into this area, hmm, interesting. As I'm revealing more of the pink flower to try and fight that halo, now I'm just revealing greenery in the background. So let's reverse that and reveal that black and white adjustment. Oh, now I'm getting rid of the green, but I'm revealing this bright halo. And the issue here, of course, is that the photo has narrow depth of field. And so that flower petal is blurred. So if I zoom back out here, I have a very narrow band of depth of field here. So the petal off there in the background is quite blurred. And so we have this gradation. But where does the flower actually end and the background begin? Uh, kind of like that selection edge. Oh, somewhere in the middle there, except you can't just say right there in the middle. Now, in theory, we can get a transition here, blend it away. In reality, that's going to be pretty tricky. If I were trying to do this for real, because of that tonal variation, what I would probably do is to actually prevent this area from being converted to black and white because it's very, very bright. And then I would probably, as a separate step, use a little trick to essentially paint color into that area of the photo. So you know, obviously, that's the quick and sloppy version of it there. We'll go ahead and put that into a clipping group so that we, oops, wrong one, so that we can uh, tidy things up a little bit. But point being is that I would have to do a lot more work. 
How many of you want to do as much work as possible with your images? Versus maybe saying, you know what, on second thought, eh, the color version is just fine. We don't need to do this you know, cliche, selective black and white type of thing. So there's going to be situations where you're just not going to be happy with your results, and therefore you might reevaluate the adjustment that you're trying to apply, or the composite you're trying to create, or you're going to need to do a lot more work to get a realistic result. And I'll show you an example of that a little bit later on today. And I think it's important to keep in mind the, uh, the importance of perfection, if you will. And so just by way of example, I, you know, part of this depends on the strength of your adjustments. I often talk about the degree of precision versus subtlety, or accuracy versus subtlety. In other words, if you're applying a very strong, not subtle adjustment, then your selection or your layer mask needs to be as accurate as possible. If you're applying a relatively subtle adjustment, then it doesn't need to be quite so accurate. The selection that you start with, for example. And so if I create a little selection, oh, about like that, that was quick and easy, little additional areas up there, that looks pretty good. So now I have the sky selected, and of course that sky needs to be darkened up just a little bit, and so I will add a curves adjustment in order to darken the sky, and just by way of illustration here, making the adjustment a little too extreme so that we can appreciate that we're affecting the sky, but we are not affecting the bird or the branch, etc. Now, one of the biggest problems we can run into as photographers when it comes to self-esteem, because we all want healthy self-esteem as a photographer, right? In order to preserve your self-esteem, one thing that I recommend avoiding is zooming in on your photo. <laughs> because then you might see something like this, where with that extreme adjustment, suddenly not so good. Now it's very, very obvious. You might not have noticed it when you were zoomed out, but as soon as you zoom in, it's very obvious. And of course, what that also means is once you print this image nice and big and go to the store and have it matted and framed and hang it on the wall, then you're going to be very disappointed with the result because now you can see all these little details very easily. If you want to get the sense that the result was way better than it really was, then I recommend zooming way out on the image and everything looks great. So again, that distinction is between subtlety and accuracy. Now, having said all that, here's the silly, and we all got a good laugh out of that at my expense, that the adjustment was not very effective. But if I make that a much more subtle adjustment, right about in there, we could probably get away with, right? And now if I zoom out and turn off the adjustment versus back on again, I'm having an effect. So if my adjustment is subtle, then I don't need to worry too much about being really precise with my selection. It's not that I'm encouraging you, to, encouraging you to be lazy about your selections, but just to bear in mind how much work you need to put in, how much work is worthwhile. And as a general rule, I recommend not worrying too much about getting a perfect selection and instead focus on the layer mask after you've created a layer mask based on your selection. So create a selection that is reasonably accurate and then perform your work. So if it's a composite or if it's a targeted adjustment, take that next step and then go back and clean up the actual layer mask because then you can see the actual effect within the image itself. And I'll show you some examples of that a little bit later on. All right, so let's get into some actual selection techniques. How many of you are lazy and proud of it? Yeah, you should always learn complicated things from a lazy person because they're going to find the most efficient, quickest, easiest way to go about that task. And so for me, I want to make a selection quickly. So I mentioned that I don't want to spend a lot of time necessarily perfecting the selection. Generally, I'd rather create my layer mask and then go from there in terms of refining things. But I want to create my selections as quickly and effectively as possible. And for that, I use the Quick Selection Tool. What a great name. It should have been called the Quick and Easy Selection Tool, but they didn't ask me. So it's just the Quick Selection Tool, and it, it's amazing. Does it work for every single image under every single circumstance? Yes, no, of course not. <laughs> not at all, but it usually gives me a pretty good starting point for most of my selections. So when in doubt, Quick Selection Tool, and if we watch, I'm gonna go ahead and start, let's assume that I wanna select this wheat field down here, I click, and if you look closely, you'll see that there's a little bit of a jagged selection outline that's gone beyond my circular brush shape. Because essentially, I'm sampling an area of the photo and saying, hey, Photoshop, find stuff like this. 
it's not going to go too crazy with it, but as I start to drag across the wheat, notice how that selection is expanding, going down, for part of this at least, all the way to the bottom of the image. And as I continue, wow, look at that. I got far enough and it just snapped and covered the whole wheat field, plus the barn, but maybe I wanted the barn, so now I can just come over the barn and boom, oh, I missed one little spot. There we go. Three clicks, magic, but I can do better. Watch the sky. Whoosh. It helps if you make that noise. Whoosh. So now I just swipe across the sky. Look, I'm swipe. Boom. Okay, I didn't go far enough. Swipe. And I've got a selection. Boom. Perfect. Is it perfect? Maybe. Maybe not. But it's a really good starting point. And I think it's one of the most important things to keep in mind when it comes to selections. You don't need that selection to necessarily be perfect right out of the gate. Start with the selection that's good enough, create your layer mask, your targeted adjustment, et cetera, and then refine as needed. And so that quick selection tool can be an absolute lifesaver. So there's a few settings here. It's pretty simple. You paint across the area of the image that you want to select, and it generally does a reasonable job of creating a selection of that area. Uh, we'll talk about adding and subtracting a little bit later, but notice that I can, first off, sample all layers. So right up here on the options bar, I have a sample all layers checkbox, and what that means is take a look at the entire image as it actually looks not just the layer that I'm currently working on. In this case, I only have the background image layer, but maybe I had an adjustment layer with a layer mask, and now I'm creating a selection based on the layer mask, not based on the image. And so as a general rule, I would say that I want that checkbox turned on because I want to create a selection based on how the image actually looks. And in fact, I could use this to my advantage and even apply an adjustment, add an adjustment layer and increase contrast, for example, so that I can get an even better selection a little bit more quickly. And then we have this auto enhance checkbox, which I always say as a general rule. As a general rule, you want this turned on. If you watch, I'm going to go ahead and deselect and I'll zoom in here and take a look at an area. If I use a smaller brush even, click and drag. And then once I release the mouse, so take a look at the edge of the barn, that arc of the roof line where it meets the sky, and it looks very jagged. I'm still holding the mouse button down. And so the auto-enhance capability has not been activated just yet. But as soon as I release the mouse, you notice how that shape gets cleaned up. It goes from being jagged to smooth. Essentially, Photoshop is evaluating the edge that I've sort of defined by virtue of where I've painted, and it's trying to more accurately identify the actual edge based on contrast, both tonal and color. And so that generally can be very, very helpful. Another little example there, it goes from being a little jagged. So that initial preview, especially over toward the top left corner, as it were, I release the mouse and it kind of snaps closer. Not necessarily perfect, but a lot better than it was. So if you find that this is somehow causing problems, you might turn it off. But guess what? I've never found that Auto Enhance causes problems. It fixes problems. But if you do see it acting oddly, you can certainly turn it off altogether. So really, it's so simple. Now, one of the interesting things, by the way, about the Quick Selection tool is that it automatically switches into Add to Selection mode. I'll talk about that more shortly. But what that means is I can click and drag and paint into, for example, the wheat in the foreground. Then I can just simply drag again and release the mouse. And then I can click and drag again. And it just keeps adding and adding and adding. Whereas for many of the other selection tools, the default behavior is to create a new selection. So every time I click or drag or whatever the behavior might be for that tool, instead of adding to the existing, I'm replacing the existing selection. So the quick selection tool is a little bit unique in that it automatically switches to the add to selection mode. We'll talk about those options in a moment. How quick and easy is that? Uh, just like, it's fun too, right? Watch this. Woo! We got a selection of the sky, just like that. Amazing. I'm having more fun than I should be allowed to. All right, so I talked about that add feature. Let's just get a better sense of that overall behavior. We'll talk about yet another option with a different image. But still using the quick selection tool just because it's quick and easy, I can click and drag, and there's part of the sky selected. 
Notice though that I have another option, the create new selection option. So for some reason, I want to create a new selection. I could click that and then come back out into the image and drag again. Uh, to me, that's not necessarily very efficient with the quick selection tool because it keeps automatically switching into the add to selection mode. So if I want to start over, then I would just deselect. Instead of dragging up here, choosing a different button, clicking and dragging again, etc., I can just go to the select menu and choose deselect or one of the many keyboard shortcuts that I think are worth keeping in mind, memorizing if you will, is Control-D on Windows, Command-D on Macintosh to deselect. So I can just very quickly get rid of a selection. And then with most of the selection tools, I'm using the quick selection tool at the moment, it automatically switches into add to select mode, add to selection mode. If I were using a different tool though, we'll see several other tools here shortly, then I would need to manually choose that option. I am in the habit of just always choosing the add to selection option, even though the quick selection tool does it for me automatically. I don't want to think about the variations, I just have a consistent workflow. And so to add to selection, I can hold the shift key on the keyboard. Whichever tool I might be using, again, with the quick selection tool, it's automatic, but there's no harm in adding with add, just hold the shift key to add to selection even though it's already set to add to selection. It's not going to like double add or something funny like that. So I can just hold the shift key and in this case click and drag to define additional areas. Because for example, we'll talk about contiguous shortly with the magic wand tool, but the quick selection tool does not create non-contiguous selections all by itself you have to add additional areas. So the tunnel through the Farioni here in Capri, I would have to add that little non-contiguous area to my selection. If, hypothetically speaking, I were to make a mistake, hypothetically speaking, <laughs> while I was making a selection, maybe I dragged too far out into the water, obviously I could undo take a step backward, control Z on Windows, command Z on Macintosh, but maybe I didn't notice that little mistake for a few additional steps and I don't want to lose all my other work, then I can just use the subtract from selection option. So in this case, holding the Alt key on Windows, Option key on Macintosh, and painting along that area that I want to remove from the selection, essentially the non-sky areas, a little more cleanup right in there. Sometimes I find that it's a little easier to just erase too much, to subtract too much from the selection, and then go back to my add to selection option. Again, holding the shift key to add to selection and the alt or option key to subtract from selection. We'll see how we can mix and match some other tools here shortly to help improve your results as well. So I find that, for example, the quick selection tool usually gives me a pretty good initial job but there are other tools that I can use that will take that a little bit further. And so, for example, if we zoom in here, I've made a little bit of a mess, admittedly. Maybe I use that subtract option here and use a smaller brush. And hold on just a second. I know I can get this to work. I know I can get a perfect, hold just, a, this will only take about seven or eight minutes, so bear with, oh wait, we have a live, audience that could number in the millions right now. So I probably shouldn't take that extra time. Instead, I'll use a different tool in order to clean up this selection. So the quick selection tool, is it perfect? No, it is so nearly perfect. It's so amazing. It makes my job so much easier when I need to create a selection. But it's still going to make mistakes. And this area down here, I've been making a complete mess of. But I'm sure we could find some little areas. Now, part of this depends on how nitpicking we need to be. But over here, if we zoom in really closely, we can see there are some pixels that were left out of the selection or that we're in that shouldn't be depending on what we're selecting. So in this case, we're selecting the sky. So there's a rock pixel that should not be selected, but it is, et cetera. Oh, there's a big old chunk of rock pixels that were included in the sky selection and they should not be. So I could subtract those areas from my selection. Now what I find that a lot of photographers do is they sort of fight with their selection tool a little bit. And usually, if you're fighting with your selection tool, it's better to have a little quiet time and move on, go talk to a different selection tool for a little while, one that's being you know, more friendly. And for me, that tends to be the lasso tool. The lasso tool is the most powerful and flexible selection tool in all of Photoshop, and yet I avoid it at all costs. Because it's not quick, it's not automated, it's all manual. 
it's you drawing. And we already saw how bad I am at drawing. And so when it comes to cleaning things up, when it comes to creating a selection, can you imagine just taking a look at the selection I have right now, of more or less the sky here, can you imagine trying to trace that? Worse, can you imagine me trying to trace that after seeing my bad drawing skills? Not at all. I don't want to trace along that, and that's exactly what the lasso tool is. It is a freeform sketch uh, tool, essentially, for drawing, for tracing along the edge. Whew, that's too much work for me. I mentioned I'm lazy, right? And so if I can go find you know, one of these areas, actually we can find a nice big area right down here that I've made a complete mess of. Instead of getting in there with the quick selection tool and making the brush so much smaller and trying to improve the result, I'm just gonna trace over these small little areas. So I switched to my lasso tool, looks like a little lasso, little rope lasso there on the toolbox. And here notice that we've moved on to some of the more mainstream selection tools, if you will. And so up on the options bar we have, the default is a new selection and then add, subtract, and intersect. You'll recall with the quick selection tool, we only had the new selection, add and subtract, not intersect. I will show you intersect shortly. So now I'm able to create uh, variations on a theme here. I'm able to fine tune my selection. So for example, I want to add this area to the selection. And we've already learned that holding the shift key on the keyboard gives us access to that add to selection option. And so I'll start where I first went astray. So we can see the reasonably, we'll kind of forget about some of these little individual pixels for the moment, just for our purposes. But if I go to the point where the selection first strayed away from the rocks, that's where I want to get started. And then I'm going to click and hold the mouse. Now this is very tedious work. It involves a lot of attention to details. So we'll ask for silence from the audience. I know you're tempted to just start applauding. No? OK. Now note, by the way, that at this point, I don't need to keep holding the shift key on the keyboard. I already told Photoshop that I want to add to selection. So by virtue of holding it when I got started, holding the shift key on the keyboard when I got started, I don't need to hold the shift key. So I can use my other hand to assist my mouse hand or to steady my mouse hand if I need to. And then once I get back to where the selection reconvenes with the edge of the rock, now I can just kind of do a lazy loop back to my original starting point. And when I release the mouse, that area will be added to the selection. Hopefully I traced perfectly along every single little pixel, et cetera. Here's another little area that I want to trace along. So I'll go trace along that little area and loop back around. If there were areas that were included in the selection that should not have been, then I just need to subtract. So I would hold the Alt key on Windows, Option key on Macintosh, same basic process, and just trace along that edge and loop back around. Perhaps the trickiest part here is keeping track of whether you need to add versus subtract. And sometimes I'll get lost. Wait, hold on, what am I selecting? Oh, right, I'm selecting the sky. So if there's sky that's missing, I need to add. If there's non-sky that's selected, I need to subtract. It can get to be a little bit confusing. But after a while, it almost becomes automatic where I keep fingers poised over the Shift key and the Alter Option key so I can add, subtract, add, subtract as needed and just go along and clean up the edge. And by the way, you'll notice I'm panning around the image with the hand tool and that can be accessed just by pressing and holding the space bar on the keyboard and then clicking and dragging to go all the way around your selection edge and make sure it's totally perfect. But that looks pretty clean at this point, I would say. I hope. We'll call it, you know, we're friends now, so we'll call it absolutely perfect. All right, so let's Actually, I'm going to create a magic wand selection here. We haven't talked yet about the magic wand tool, but I promise that I will. I want to talk about feathering and why I don't do it. I never feather selections, which is actually a lie. I do feather selections, but the only time I feather selections is when I'm trying to demonstrate why I never feather selections which gets me very confusing the more I talk about it. So if I'm applying an adjustment here, do I need my selection to be feathered? Yes. Do I know precisely how many pixels I need to feather the selection by? No. And I don't want to guess. So what is feathering? You'll recall, remember Fallon? The cute little horse in the red barn, standing in the doorway. And I made a selection, and I had areas that were partially selected. Black, not selected. White, selected. Shades of gray, partially selected. 
Well, you can also think of that in certain contexts as feathering, as a gradation or transition. So do I need the edge of my selection to be feathered? That's a trick question. But I need the final result to be feathered. And so let's just not feather. We've already seen an example of that with the lilac breasted roller. Uh, we'll go with a curves adjustment here and make an extreme adjustment. And there we see a non-feathered edge. I would say that the selection edge was reasonably precise. It wasn't in the wrong area, it's just too abrupt. I'm transitioning from 100% selected to 0% selected. Neighboring pixels, selected, not selected. Affected by my adjustment, not affected by my adjustment, and they're right next to each other. And so instead, I need to apply a degree of feathering. So let's go ahead and reload that selection and get rid of my adjustment. I can go to the Select menu and then choose Modify, followed by Feather. And then I get to pick a number, any number. Uh, five, no, wait, four, maybe three. It could be six, might even be two. Now, with experience, you'll start to get a better sense. Oh, I probably just need two pixels of feathering here. But why guess? Because let's say, you know, I owe up maybe 10. I'm very, feeling very generous today. I'm going to give that 10 pixels of feathering, and then I'll add my curves adjustment. And whoa, let's zoom out a little bit. And what a lovely halo we have here. Because my feathering was too much. So we undo, undo, there's my selection again. Uh, let's go back a step further so that it's not feathered, and then select modify feather, and probably like maybe half as much would be okay. And then we add a curves adjustment, and this should only take, a, oh, it's still too much. All right, don't worry, I can do this in less than six minutes. <laughs> the point is, obviously, I'm not sure exactly how much feathering I need. And this is an easy case. How many pixels? Probably one. Because for all intents and purposes, this is a non-feathered subject. Hope if it's in focus, <laughs> and if those stones are nice and solid, then I have a very crisp edge to my object, and therefore a crisp edge to the selection probably works well. But I need a tiny bit of transition so it doesn't look too obvious. But I don't know how much, and so you might have noticed, once I've applied an adjustment, if you've ever worked with a targeted adjustment before. So here is my non-feathered edge, a layer mask based on a non-feathered selection. I could have feathered the selection to achieve a good final result, but it might take a lot of trial and error. Instead, I can just go to the masks tab on the properties panel, and there's a feather control right there, and I can just increase until I get just the right amount. So maybe right in there, give it. Obviously, this is a ridiculously strong adjustment. It's not what I would normally apply to my sky, thank goodness. But again, probably around about one pixel will do the trick. Here I'm at you know, half a pixel even. When I get back to the adjustment itself and make it a little bit more you know, normal, maybe something like that, if I just want to darken the sky a tiny little bit or add some contrast or whatever it might be, whatever my goal is for that specific area of the image, I would rather apply that feathering based on an actual view at the actual effect I'm applying. So I'll add my adjustment. And that's why I never feather the actual selection, even though I always want the result of a feathered selection. I'm just saving that step of my workflow for a little bit later. Whether it's a targeted adjustment, so an adjustment layer with a layer mask that was based on a selection, or a composite image where I'm combining two or more images. Rather than trying to figure out what might be the right amount of feathering, I'd rather just save that step for later when I can see the actual final result. All right, let's magic wand. Make a little magic here. So the quick selection tool was the first tool that we took a look at. It's sort of a variation on the magic wand tool, which has been around forever in Photoshop. The quick selection tool is relatively new, all things considered. And the magic wand tool is now hiding underneath the quick selection tool. So if I want to see the tools that are hiding from view. All of the buttons, which actually happens to be most of the buttons, over on the toolbox, you'll see a little tiny triangle at the bottom right corner of most of these buttons. That means there's more. There are more tools hiding from view, and I can either right-click 
or click and hold in order to bring up a flyout menu that gives me the various other options. In the case of the quick selection tool, the other tool that's hiding there is the magic wand tool. In other cases, we might have more hiding tools. And the magic wand tool is very similar in a lot of respects to the quick selection tool in terms of being a sampling tool. In other words, I'm essentially saying to Photoshop, hey, you see this thing over here? Can you make a selection based on that? So if I click on the sky, I'm saying, make a selection of the sky, please. Or if I click on the cloud, I'm saying, make a selection of the cloud, please, or the windmill, or you know, whatever it might be. But of course, there are some settings. You can see here that I'm not getting a very good selection. I can use some settings to determine, essentially, how much of the image I want selected. So if I click on a white area of the image, relatively speaking, then the slightly darker shade of gray areas of the cloud are not being selected. How do I change that? Well, that would be the tolerance setting, by and large. So it's a sampling tool. It's essentially the eyedropper tool, literally just sampling a pixel value, but then it uses that sample to figure out which other pixels have a similar value. And so I'm trying to select pixels that match or nearly match the pixel that I clicked on. Pixel or pixels. So first off, I have a sampling option here. I can choose point sample versus 3x3 three three average or 5x5 five five average all the way up to 101 by 101 average. In other words, take a block of pixels, average them all together, and then base my evaluation of pixels on that. So if we try to be reasonably precise here, right in the middle of this bright spot, I'm going to click with a point sample. And actually, let's lower the tolerance just so that we get a better sense of the impact. So right about there, we've got you know, kind of memorize that shape, if you will. And then we go to the 101 by 101. Now, you still have memorized the shape of that original selection. Everybody has a good sense of what that actually looked like. Now I've switched to 101 by 101. Now I should talk faster, because people are going to forget the shape of the shape if I don't get to it real quickly. So we're going to click. And it looks quite a bit different, doesn't it? It's a much larger selection. Here, while I have that, I'll take a few steps backward. And there we have it. So a much larger selection because I've averaged a series of values together. And so I'm going to help eliminate the impact of texture, essentially. So if it's very textured, you might increase this value. As a very general rule, I don't go above about 5 by five, by 5 average. It usually does a good job of giving me a good average to work with. But that's sort of a secondary effect compared to tolerance. So the tolerance determines how nearly matching pixel values need to be. So if we take this down to zero and I click again in that same little spot, so I'm clicking right over here in this bright area of the cloud, click, and look at my tiny little, just edges of these bright areas of the cloud. Because the tolerance is low, so the pixels have to be very, very close in value, essentially meaning RGB values. Each individual channel, red, green, and blue, is actually evaluated individually. And so it's not quite so simple. But the idea is that the pixels have to be very, very nearly a match to the pixel that I clicked on. Versus, let's raise that value all the way up to 255, the maximum value. And now I'm going to try to click in exactly the same spot. And now I get a selection of the entire image, because I've said my tolerance is so high. Well, I clicked on a white pixel. This one over here is black. Ah, that's close enough, right? So we probably don't want that. And as a general rule, I never go beyond approximately a value of about 16. Approximately. So let's try 16. Oh, I thought for sure it was going to work good. Didn't I? I had no idea that it wouldn't work perfectly. So this is where photographers have a tendency to get into trouble, because they desperately try to achieve a one-click selection. So they set this tolerance. No, that didn't work. So deselect. Let's adjust tolerance upward just a little bit. I'm going to click again. No, that didn't quite do it. Deselect. So I'm going to increase that tolerance a little bit and then click again. No, that didn't do it. So I'm going to deselect. I'm going to increase that tolerance a little bit and I'm going to click again. We're getting really close and I'm almost there. And then that might have done it. Do I have a? There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, a perfect selection in just one click.
Except it took me like 500 clicks to get there because I had to adjust my value, select, deselect, adjust my value, select, deselect, etc. So instead of trying to achieve that one click selection that actually took you lots and lots of clicks to get to, my recommendation is to use a moderately low setting for tolerance. Somewhere around 16 generally works well for those situations where you're inclined to use the magic wand tool anyway. So I'll generally start with 16 and initially say, oh, gee, I thought I was going to get a better selection than that. Yeah, but I can just add to selection. So let me come click out. Wow, did that do it? Oh, maybe up in here, right there. Ah, oh, three clicks. Three clicks. And that was fewer clicks than it took to make a one click selection because I don't have to do all this trial and error. I can just use a moderately low setting for tolerance and then use that shift key to click on additional areas. And note, by the way, if I take a couple of steps backward, I don't have to actually click in an area that's not selected. I'm just sampling additional values. So you see this area right in here that is not selected. I don't have to hold the shift key and click inside that area to add it to the selection. I just have to hold the shift key and click on an area that's a reasonable match. So right over here, outside of that selection, it's going to be close enough. So you don't have to worry about trying to get exactly right in between a little selection boundary edge. You can just simply hold the shift key and click around in a handful of additional areas of the image, increasing the number of sample points, essentially expanding the selection each time. Then we have the anti-alias checkbox up here on the options bar. Just leave it turned on. That's the simple approach. Because what shape will our selection be? Cumulus cloud shaped, perhaps, or you know, whatever the shape might actually end up being, it's some random shape, which means it might be comprised of certain areas that are vertical lines and certain areas that are horizontal lines, but mostly it's going to be all these diagonal curvy lines, right? Well, what shape are pixels? For our purposes, they're square, which means they have hard edges. So how does a diagonal line that is selecting actual pixels deal with these pixel edges? It's going to be a zigzag selection. What anti-aliasing does, essentially, if you think about like a staircase pattern, right? And so let's say the lower portion is black and the upper portion is white, so we have a black to white staircase. Now we're adding middle gray pixels on top of each step so that we get the appearance of a smoother line. So that's what that anti-aliasing does. It gives us a little bit smoother selections, and in the context of photographic images, I would say I always want that. Contiguous. This is a unique feature of the magic wand tool. More importantly, we can turn off contiguous. We talked about contiguous in the context of the quick selection tool where we don't have a non-contiguous option. We're always only selecting areas that are contiguous to where I've painted. What does that mean? Well, it just means neighboring or bordering on or however you want to define contiguous. So if I turn on the contiguous checkbox, and let's just go ahead and zoom in on our windmill here, I click into this little triangular sort of pie wedge, mmm, pie. Uh, of the image, and I only get that one little area included in my selection. I can hold the shift key and click on that area, and shift click on that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that. Who's already tired of watching me shift click on lots and lots of individual areas of the image? Versus if I deselect and turn off <laughs> contiguous and click in that same yummy apple pie shaped piece, now I get all of those non-contiguous areas included in the selection. And I would suggest, again, that for those situations where you're using the magic wand tool, more than likely you want contiguous turned off because it's part of the reason that I went to the magic wand tool instead of the quick selection tool is that I had a bunch of non-contiguous areas that I needed to include within my selection. And then finally, on the options bar up here, we have the sample all layers checkbox. We talked about that in the context of the quick selection tool. Again, it means create a selection based on the actual appearance of the image, including adjustments and everything else. So generally speaking, I would leave that turned on. Sometimes you might be working on a composite and you need to create a selection of one portion of one layer of the image. But under typical workflows, that's going to be the exception rather than the rule. So as a general rule, sample all layers turned on. And again, I mentioned before, we have the create new selection, add to selection, subtract from selection, and intersect. So if I have this always set to create a new selection, 
which most of the tools will preserve that setting. It's the quick selection tool that automatically switches to the add to selection option. Then I can hold the shift key to add to selection, the alt or option key to subtract from selection, and something else when it comes to intersect, which we will, I promise, talk about later. All right. So I just want to underscore sort of a workflow thing. It's a really, I think, very important consideration, and that is this ability to mix and match. I've talked about it already a little bit in the context of the lasso tool. Uh, but for example, if I go back to my quick selection tool, and I'm going to increase my brush size, I can use the left and right square bracket keys, by the way, to adjust that brush size as needed, rather than going up to the options bar to adjust it. And there we have it, a perfect selection. How do I know it's perfect? Because I have not yet zoomed in. So I'm living in this wonderful bliss of ignorance. And then I zoom in. And oops, the chimney here is included in the selection of the sky. And this other little mini chimney vent is included in that selection. There's even a few additional areas here that should not be included in the selection. And as I talked about previously, in the context of the quick selection tool, switching then to the lasso tool. That's just one example. I'm going to show you a variety of other techniques, and we can always use any of my other techniques for creating an initial selection, and then come back and clean things up. More often than not, I would use the lasso tool for that cleanup, but as you'll see a little bit later, there are a variety of other techniques that I could use as well. Now certainly, I could just add to selection using a real small brush, or in this case, subtract from selection, using a really small brush for that quick selection tool, and that might produce a good result, but as you can see here, not perfect. So again, switching to the lasso tool, and then we can cut out this little portion and this little portion over here, just tracing. So always keep in mind, and this is, right now we're talking about selections in Photoshop. This could just as easily have been just about anything else. Bear in mind, there are about 47 million ways to do any task you can dream up inside of Photoshop. So a lot of this is figuring out what makes the most sense right now. You could trace by hand every single selection using only the lasso tool. You will spend a lot of time making your selections, but it could be done. You could use the rectangular marquee tool and make tiny little selections, adding each little pixel to your selection until you're finished. You're gonna spend a long, long, long frustrating time creating that selection, but it could be done. So really what it boils down to is figuring out what's the quickest way to get started with the particular selection I need, and then what's the quickest or easiest way to fine tune that to perfection as needed, keeping in mind that some of that fine tuning will be done a little bit later on the actual layer mask. All right, so we've run out of selection tools. No, not really. We didn't even talk about the rectangular lasso, or sorry, the rectangular marquee tool, the elliptical marquee tool, the single row marquee tool. Yes, I can click on the image and create a selection of a single row of pixels. Not usually all that helpful with a photographic image, but certainly more helpful with you know, graphic design and that sort of stuff. The lasso tool we talked about, we also have a polygonal lasso tool as well as a magnetic lasso tool the latter being for the selection of metal objects. <laughs> no. Thank you for chuckling. Uh, so we have some other tools. I don't tend to use all that often because they don't tend to give me a tremendous advantage. But there are, in addition to those other tools, a variety of commands or techniques or whatever you want to call these inside of Photoshop, one of those being the color range command. So I can create a selection based on a range of colors. Now. For those of you that missed the disclaimers at the beginning of the session, one of the other disclaimers I should have mentioned is that when I'm going to demonstrate a technique, I choose an image that makes it really, really easy on me. Because I like to make things easy on me. Especially with the pressure of potentially millions of people watching the live stream right now. And so this image, I'm going to create a color range selection. Couldn't I just as easily use the quick selection tool to produce a selection very quickly and easily? Yes, of course, but I needed something to demonstrate the color range command, and I wanted it to be an easy image to work with to minimize the stress on myself, <laughs> because that's how selfish I am. So we're gonna go to the select menu. I wanna make sure, first of all, in this case I only have one layer, the background image layer, but I wanna make sure that whatever layer I'm going to create a selection based on 
is the active layer. So maybe I had already, for example, added a curves adjustment with some sort of effect. I would want to go back to my, in this case, background image layer. So just click on the thumbnail. For the layer, it represents what I want to select. So here I'm obviously selecting either the rocks or the sky based on color. I want to select all the red rock stuff, the orange stuff, or I want to select all the blue stuff. So with the applicable layer active on the layers panel, again, just clicking the thumbnail if you're not sure, to make it active, then I can go to the select menu and choose the color range command. So select color range, ooh, what a pretty black and white image I have here. Remember, all of our selections are just stencils. White is selected, black is not selected. To get started here, I like to turn off my preview. So the selection preview down here at the bottom of the color range dialog, I'll generally set that to none to get started. I also like to set my fuzziness way down to zero just to get started. And I'll fine tune that a little bit later. Then I can click in the image. So at the moment, you'll see that by default, among my three eyedroppers here over toward the right-hand side, I'm working with the first one. That is my sample button, essentially. I'm sampling an individual pixel value. So I can just click, and you see if I click in the sky, in my preview, this little thumbnail inside the color range dialog, will update based on where I click. And because I have my fuzziness set down way low, I'm seeing just a tiny little band of area that's selected. But one of the things that I can do here is then add or subtract. Now a color range is literally that. It is a range of color values. So I can't select the greens and the reds, but not the oranges in between. It is a contiguous range of colors. Think of it as a section of the color wheel. So it's important to keep that in mind, but I can expand that range or contract that range with the plus and minus <laughs> eyedroppers. And one of the things that's unique about the color range command is that I can now click and drag across the image, similar to what we can do with the quick selection tool as opposed to the magic wand tool. With quick selection, we're painting around the image. With the magic wand tool, we're click, click, clicking on different areas of the photo. So I could actually click and drag across the sky, and as I do so, you'll see that that selection preview is expanding. Or if I go back to my red rock color there and then choose my plus eyedropper, as I drag around, never letting go of the mouse, then I'm adding to that range of colors, all of the various you know, kind of reds and yellows, essentially. And as I keep on painting around that area of the image, I'm expanding that range of colors, in this case to include all of the yellows and oranges, maybe kind of reddish tones, but none of the cyans or blues. At this point, then I will typically switch my preview back to grayscale so that I can see a black and white kind of preview of the effect. And then I might adjust the fuzziness. Is fuzziness like feathering? Yes. Is fuzziness like tolerance? Yes. It's kind of both, all rolled up into one. So it's like feathering in that it'll create a transition. You'll start to see some blending. So notice how we're getting shades of gray here as opposed to that more crisp black versus white. So I start to blend into shades of gray. So I'm getting a feathering effect. But the feathering affects similar colors more than dissimilar, non-similar colors. So I'm expanding that selection. I'm getting more fuzzy in the areas of red and yellow and orange, but I'm not feathering out into the sky because that doesn't match the color scheme that I'm using as the basis of my selection. If I start going way too far with fuzziness, then I will, but notice that I still get a good outline for the rocks in this case. I still got that line being relatively crisp. I'm just starting to blend in. So it's this really, really cool combination of feathering and tolerance all rolled into one. And so I'll start with a very low value and then increase as needed. And it looks like right about there will give me what appears to be, to the unaided eye, an absolutely perfect selection. That's where applause typically breaks out. I mean, it's different for every crowd, but there you have it. A selection, so a selection based on the color range. Now, as I mentioned, in this case, I could have very easily used the quick selection tool in order to create a selection of the rocks or the sky. 
but what you will find is that this color range command works in situations that are a lot more tricky, that aren't quite as easily to define exactly where an object ends. A big field of flowers, for example, and you just want the flower petals, but not the greenery or the sky, you can more easily define a specific range there with that degree of blending. And so it can work out very, very nicely. I also find that from time to time, I want to create a selection more or less based on luminance values in the image. This is one of those that's so very cool when it works, but it only works a fairly small percentage of the time. But I want to show you the technique because in those situations where it does work, it can be quite helpful. So think of situations where you want to apply an adjustment just to the shadow areas, maybe brighten up the shadow areas a little bit, or you want to tone down the highlights or shift the color in the highlights of the shadows just a little bit. So creating a selection based on brightness levels within the image. I'll show you a variation on this related to color shortly. So I'm going to start off by making a copy of my background image layer. This is just a working copy. Eventually, I could just throw this away. But I need to make a copy of the background image layer because this is very much a destructive process. I'm going to obliterate pixel values in this copy of the image. So I need a working copy for purposes of creating my selection. And then I'm going to reduce the opacity for this background copy. Now, this is literally a copy. It's an exact duplicate of the pixels on the layer below. I'm going to reduce the opacity. I can just press the letter 5 on the keyboard to set the opacity to 50%, or I can come up toward the top right of the Layers panel and set that value manually if I prefer. And you'll see there's absolutely no effect on the image whatsoever. Because I've made the top layer translucent, I can see through it to some extent to the exact same pixels below. So no impact at the moment, but there will be an impact in just a moment. So I go to the Image menu and choose Adjustments, and I'm going to use the Threshold command, one that many photographers have never heard of, many more have never used, at least for any useful purpose. So Image Adjustments Threshold. And what Threshold does is it enables me to convert the image to black and white. No, not the good kind of black and white that's pretty and you might want to print and hang on the wall, but literally black and white. Pixels are either black or white, kind of like a stencil, kind of like a selection. Areas are either selected or not selected. So I'm taking this image and making it all black and white, one or the other, two values. But I'm able to choose the threshold. At which point will we transition from the black pixels for the shadows versus the white pixels for the highlights? At the moment, I'm switching at middle gray, but I could increase that value. So only the very, very bright areas of the image are white. Or I can take that down so that only the very, very dark areas of the image are black. And because I made a background copy layer that I'm working on, and I set the opacity to 50%, now I'm able to kind of see through this black and white image to the color below so that I can get a reasonably good preview of the actual effect. So maybe I want something like this, for example, because I want to lighten up the dark shadow detail or you know whatever the purpose might be. Again, I'm defining the area that I want to work on based on luminance in the image. So whenever I've decided that I've reached a good value for that threshold, maybe somewhere right about in there, I'll click OK. And I have the threshold effect. Now I need to do something with it. Well, first off, I'll go ahead and bring the opacity back up for my background copy layer. So there are my darkest pixels are black. My other pixels, everything brighter than whatever that threshold was, will be white in this image. Now I want to make a selection based on this. You might be tempted to use the magic wand tool, but I'm not because I'm even lazier than that. As magical as it is, there's a better technique. If I simply go to the channels panel and click this little button right here, this dashed circle icon down at the bottom of the channels panel, that is the load channel as selection button, which means Load a selection where the areas of the channel that are white will be selected and the black areas will not be selected. And now I magically have a selection of, in this case, the bright areas. If I wanted the opposite, I can go to the Select menu and choose Inverse. And now I have a selection of just the darkest shadow areas. So just for illustrative purposes, 
obviously this is a non-feathered selection, but I can adjust only those darkest shadow areas of the image. So maybe I want to get a little more contrast, darken up the shadows a little bit, or maybe I want to open them up and make it look like a beautiful HDR rendition. <laughs> or whatever the case might be. Obviously, I'd want to feather that selection to some extent as well. But point being is that we can use luminosity in the image as the basis of a selection. And then we finally get to the intersect option. And this one's interesting because there's a method that we can use actually to sort of force the intersect feature if we'd like. So I'm going to show you that but then explain why it's really not all that necessary. So once again, I'm going to create, in this case, a color range selection. So I'll go to the Select menu and choose Color Range. And as we've already seen, I can create a selection. So if I want to select all the red stuff, for example, I can use the eyedropper to click in a red area. And then I can use the plus eyedropper in order to expand that range, to keep clicking on additional areas until I have a selection of all of the red, in this case, in the photo. Obviously, I can still adjust the fuzziness setting. But what if I only really wanted to select the bib up here in the top left corner of the image? Well, there are two things I could do, one of which works you know, sometimes, maybe most of the time. Uh, and the other, which is I think is just easier, and it's a handy technique to be aware of, I think. So first off, we have this localized color clusters option. So I'll turn on localized color clusters, and now the range control is enabled. When I was sampling, I only sampled in the bib that I actually wanted to select. I didn't sample anywhere else in the image. So now, when I reduce the value for range, it's like shining a spotlight on just the area of the image where I had sampled. And if I'm lucky, I can get a perfect result by finding just the right value for range. In this case, it's not quite working perfectly, but nearly so. And keep in mind, as a general rule, I don't need a perfect selection. I just need a really good starting point that I can then refine as needed. So just for sake of illustrating that concept a little bit, I'll bring that range value back out just so that we can kind of see what's going on there. I click OK, and I get a selection. Well, this is kind of sort of like the intersect command. And the intersect command is one that gets to be very, very confusing to a lot of photographers. Because intersect, in the context of a selection, means that we want to create a selection that represents the area where the existing selection overlaps with the new selection that I'm in the process of drawing right now. Wait, what? Or like the mathematical and operation. So like this area and this area and where they overlap, that equals my result. Or was it or? or what was the formula again? I don't know. To me, it's a lot simpler, though. If you think of intersect as select everything, or deselect everything, I should say, deselect everything except this little area. So if we go back, in fact, I'm going to go back to my color range selection here, and I'm going to get rid of that localized color clusters option just to kind of exaggerate this effect a little bit more. Let's add to this range, something like that. So we can see what a mess, you might say, the selection is, because all I want selected is this bib up here in the top left corner. But at the moment, I also have this bib, and 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 this bib, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if we look closely, we probably find some additional areas of the image that I didn't even realize are selected. All I want is this bib right up here. So all I need to do is to tell Photoshop to deselect everything except this. So if I grab my lasso tool, for example, because it will be so easy to draw a lazy loop around this bib up at the top left corner, if I choose the intersect option, what I'm saying is, you see this bib? Keep that, but deselect everything else. So deselect everything but this, this meaning whatever I define right now. And of course, there's a keyboard shortcut for that. So you'll recall, by default, my selection tools, with the exception of quick selection, they default to create a new selection. So if I were to click right now, my selection disappears and is replaced by a brand new selection. I can access the Add to Selection option by holding the Shift key. 
I can access the subtract from selection option by holding the alt key on Windows or the option key on Macintosh. And I can access the intersect option by holding both of those keys. So shift alt on Windows or shift option on Macintosh. So just hold both of those modifier keys and I'll click and drag a lazy loop around this red bib up here. I don't even have to be very precise, thankfully, because we witnessed the quality of my drawing skills earlier today. I just draw a lazy loop around that first bib up at the top left corner and now I'm telling Photoshop deselect everything except this area. So again, holding the shift and alt or option keys. When I release the mouse, as if by magic, only that one bib is selected. I've run into many photographers who are confused by the intersect option and then once they kind of understand the concept, they find absolutely no use for it whatsoever. But I do believe that if you keep in mind that it's deselect everything but this, you'll find that actually you can use it a surprising number of, in a surprising number of scenarios. I use it all the time in terms of cleaning up my selections. And then I mentioned this before, but I just want to underscore that ability to intersect. If I wanted to create a selection of the uh, emergency escape, the fire escape ladder here, it seems like that would be a little bit more challenging because there's all these thin little lines I have to deal with. Of course, once you know about the magic wand tool, suddenly it's very simple. Make sure our contiguous option is turned off. The point here is that in many cases, it's easier or it seems easier to create the selection of what you don't want rather than what you do want. And just bear in mind that we can always invert our selection. So there, wow, did we really just do that in only two clicks? Sometimes I even amaze myself. I mean, <laughs> sometimes even I am amazed by Photoshop. Uh, so two clicks with the magic wand tool, clicking once to sample in the sky, holding shift key and clicking in another area of the sky. And I have the selection, except what I really wanted to select was the ladder, the metal structure there. I can simply invert that selection. So I can go to the select menu and choose inverse. Those of you that are collecting keyboard shortcuts and don't want to miss a one, that would be Control-Shift-I on Windows or Command-Shift-I on Macintosh to invert that selection so that, for example, now at this moment I have just the, the metal areas, essentially. So if I go into curves, then we'll see that I'm able to apply a very obvious adjustment. Let's take the black point way up here. So there's my obvious adjustment for just the metal areas of the image. I create a selection of the sky and then invert it. So a very simple, easy, fast, fun step that you can use to help ensure that you're getting the best selections possible and that you can work as efficiently as possible. So often you'll find, you know, if we take a look way back, do you remember? the image of the barn that we were using to demonstrate the quick selection tool, it seems like it was several days ago, doesn't it? <laughs> Feels like just today. And when I was dragging across the wheat field, it took a lot longer to get my actual selection. When I drag across the sky, boom, one little swoop and it's done. So even if I wanted to select the lower portion of the image, the foreground, if you will, I would still select the sky because it was so much faster and easier to do a quick little swoop and then Command-Shift-I or Control-Shift-I to invert instead of doing a lot more dragging around in the lower portion of the image. All right. Anybody thirsty? No? Okay. You see, the reason that's funny is because I'm using an image of a beer glass from Liechtenstein. So one of the things that I think is worth keeping in mind, this isn't something that I use all that often, but we can actually transform our selection. So we've seen a variety of ways where we can fine tune a selection, add or subtract, and there's a bunch of other possibilities in Photoshop that we just don't have the time for today. I should hasten to add that I do have an entire video course that's all about creating selections. It's like three hours of detailed lessons on creating selections. Uh, you can check that out at graylearning.com. But one of the things that I do use on an occasional basis, not a huge percentage of the time, but occasionally, is the ability to transform a selection. So this is just one example where you might run into a situation like that. So I'm using the elliptical marquee tool, which, as the name implies, allows you to make selections in an elliptical shape, even a circular shape, if you'd like. And so I can click and drag to define that shape. 
If I want it to be circular, I can hold the shift key. Otherwise, I can just release the shift key and make my ellipse. And in this case, it's perfect. It's like they had this image in mind over at Adobe when they invented the elliptical marquee tool because I now need to make an elliptical selection, a selection of an elliptical object. What are the odds? Well, I can hold the spacebar key while I'm in the process of creating my selection to move the selection. So I'm still holding the mouse button down. I've not let go of the mouse yet. I'm in the middle of creating my selection. If I press and hold the space bar, then I can move that selection around. So with a combination of holding the space bar to move, then releasing the space bar to adjust the overall dimensions, then holding the space bar to move, then we quickly find out that there's clearly something wrong with my elliptical marquee tool, or with my logo, or with my photographic technique, because what's happened here is that I have an ellipse. It's not exactly an ellipse. It's stretched. It's skewed a little bit because the perspective wasn't head on, wasn't directly orthogonal to the logo. I'm kind of looking downward at it a little bit. And so it's warped, you might say. So I need to warp, you might say, the selection or transform or free transform. If you're familiar with the free transform command, we can stretch and skew. Like, hypothetically speaking, if I had a picture of myself that I needed to post on the website, I could use the transform command to squeeze it horizontally and instantly drop 20 pounds. But here I have a little bit more complicated issue at hand. So I'm going to go to the Select menu, and I'm going to choose Transform Selection. So I'm not using the actual transform commands that we use for pixels. I'm using a special version of the transform command, essentially, for the selection itself. So Select followed by Transform Selection. And now I get a transform box, a bounding box on my selection, so I can drag the edges to perfectly align with the edges of my logo. And I would have to say, with all modesty, I've done a pretty perfect job here. Look at that. That edge aligns perfectly with the edge of the logo, except I don't have to go very far to find that the selection moves away, then comes back, and then moves, whoa, really moves far away over there. And then it overlaps. I mean, it's just all over the place. It's a mess. And that's, again, because I'm creating an elliptical selection with a you know, warped elliptical logo. Warped. Yes, I can go up to the options bar here. You see that little window that looks all bent? That's the warp control. And if I click on that, then I am entered into essentially this warp mode of the transform command. And you see I've got a bunch of handles and whatnot. Let me zoom in just a little bit so we can see what's going on there. I have all these various anchor points and additional lines and whatnot. You can basically just ignore those because they're not going to help you out very much, I promise. And instead, just click on the edge of the selection and drag it. Now the problem is that the actual selection won't move until you release the mouse button. So what you need to do is get your pointer exactly on the edge of the selection. So here at the top left, you can see it's, I'm pretty far away from that edge of the logo. So I'll click and hold my mouse button down right exactly on the edge of the selection and then drag up to exactly on the edge of the logo and release. And then I'll come over here and basically repeat that process. And I need to click. And the only reason I need to click with such precision is that I need to move the edge to exactly where I want it to fall. Notice how I'm getting all sorts of you know, bending to the various anchor points and lines and everything else outward. I'm not even going to worry about any of that. I'm simply going to continue going around the ellipse. And anywhere that the selection doesn't perfectly match, I'm going to point right at the selection and then click and drag outward or inward as needed until oh, we got a little more down here. And that looks pretty perfect. Shall we zoom in? No, we shall not. <laughs> because there's a chance that it might not be perfect yet. But it's very nearly. And you can see how if I continue fine tuning and getting things lined up just right, I'm warping. And I'm letting Photoshop essentially do all of the real work of figuring out how do we need to warp this anchor point and that one. No, I just want to move the selection. 
And so just drag the selection into position. When you're all finished, when you think you've got everything perfected, then you can click the check mark button, the commit button up on the options bar, or you can press enter or return on the keyboard, or you can double click inside your bounding box, and then you have a selection that by all accounts appears to be perfectly aligned. And we're gonna take that as a given because I'm afraid to zoom in and find out I might be off by one pixel and you'll all mock me forever. Mm. Not really. All right. Anybody ever do any narrow depth of field photography? All the time, love it. And so this uh, photo of an allium, we've got a very clear distinction in terms of focus, and so I can actually create a selection based on what is in focus versus not in focus. And so with my image open, I'll just go onto the select menu and then choose focus area. I'll move this dialog out of the way so we can see what happens. Notice a little spinning little shape down here at the bottom left that was indicating some work was being done. And there you have it. That, that's all it takes. Just issue the ground. Now, is it always perfect? No, of course not. Uh, but what I do find is that more often than not, if I disable the auto feature and then adjust my range, I usually have a very difficult time doing any better than what Photoshop was able to do. So if I reduce the value here, now I have just like three little pixels down here that are uh, actually selected. It's based primarily on texture, so determining which areas have smooth texture versus a little more coarse texture. And so I can increase that value, but honestly I find that generally speaking with the auto option turned on, and then same for noise, because noise obviously can be perceived as texture, when it's not real texture, even smooth areas might have noise. So those smooth areas with noise might be perceived as having texture and therefore being in focus when in fact they're out of focus. Again, that auto option generally works pretty well. Usually I do wanna have the soften edge option turned on because by definition, I usually don't have a real smooth, I don't have a real crisp transition from areas that are in focus to out of focus. They sort of blend from one to the next, and so I generally want to soften up that edge as part of this process. Now you might notice that the stem is not included as part of my selection because the stem is very smooth. It doesn't have much in the way of texture to it, so from Photoshop's perspective, it looks out of focus because it's so smooth. I could, if I wanted to, notice that I have the quick selection tool essentially built in here. I could add to selection and subtract from selection right here inside of my focus area dialog. I don't like to do that because I find that usually I just start making a mess of things. I'd rather start with that initial selection and then clean things up afterwards. So I could certainly add and subtract here, but remember our ability to mix and match with all these various selection tools and techniques. So I would tend to save that for later. Which essentially means that, by and large, for images where this particular technique works well, it's usually just a matter of choosing the command from the menu and clicking OK, and you've got yourself a selection of whatever areas were in focus, more or less. And so now that I have that basic selection created, I might, for example, use my quick selection tool and we'll use a slightly larger brush here and just add to selection. Let's see how it does there. Oh, pretty good. We missed a little tiny spot there. Now it went out a little bit too far, so I'll use the Alter Option key to subtract from selection and right there as well and in there, and that looks to be pretty good. Amazing. All right. One of my favorites now. And yes, I mentioned at the beginning I use images that make it a little bit easier for myself so that it's not too challenging to actually create a good result and impress the audience. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, make it easy on myself. So here I'm going to use a technique that will work remarkably well with this image, but I promise you works well in a variety of situations. Now you remember our luminance technique where we were using that threshold command to define a split in luminance values for the photo so that I could select just the dark areas or just the bright areas. Now I'm gonna do something similar, but on a per channel basis, which essentially means based on color contrast as opposed to luminance contrast. So here, I have a field of yellow flowers with a lot of green in it, of course, and then I have the blue or cyan sky. There's pretty good color separation there, and I can use that color separation as the basis of a selection channels contain our color separation information. Red, green, and blue. 
or red and cyan, green and magenta, blue and yellow. And so if we have any degree of color contrast, there's a very good chance that this technique will work. So the first step is to go to the channels panel rather than the layers panel. If you don't have channels panel visible, you can just go to the window menu. And there you'll find all the various panels that you can choose from, including channels. And then on the channels panel, what we want to do is to click in turn on each of the thumbnails for our individual color channels. So I have red, green, and blue because this is, of course, an RGB image. And so I go to the red channel and, okay, we sort of kind of separated the sky from the foreground, not exactly. The green channel, almost never going to be the best channel for this technique because there's just too much detail on it. Red usually will work well for portraits. Blue will work well for outdoor scenes, landscapes and whatnot because we've got sky versus foreground. So that looks pretty good. Not perfect but a really good starting point. And so I'm going to use this as my starting point. I need to tweak it a little bit. I need to enhance contrast. But I don't want to mess with my blue channel directly because that blue channel is determining which areas of the image appear blue versus yellow. And so I would alter the color balance, essentially, by working directly on that blue channel. So instead, I want to make a copy. So I'll drag the blue channel down to the Create a New channel button or create a new layer button if it was on the layers panel that blank sheet of paper icon down at the bottom of the layers of the channels panel right here so it's found on both right now we're working on the channels panel that creates a blue copy channel so now I'm not working on one of my color bearing channels my red green and blue channels I'm actually working on what would be referred to now as an alpha channel essentially and I want to enhance contrast so I'll go to the image menu and choose adjustments followed by levels and then I'll drag the white point in until the sky turns white. And I'll drag the black point in until the foreground turns black. And I essentially want as much contrast as possible. This is sort of similar to that threshold command, at least in terms of the overall result, the concept at play here. And so I'm gonna squeeze those black and white points together. What I'm most concerned about is the transition between the area that I want to select, perhaps the foreground, versus the area that I don't want to select, maybe the sky. This is as good as I can get. It's not perfect. We can see all those white specks down below, but that doesn't worry me at all. I'll go ahead and click OK to apply that change. And now how am I going to clean this up? Well, I think it's worth keeping in mind. Remember, a selection is basically a stencil. And we might use that selection as the basis of a layer mask, an alpha channel, a saved selection, we might work in quick mask mode. There's all these different options, but it all relates to the same concept, a stencil. And keep in mind, at the beginning of this presentation, I demonstrated my lackluster drawing skills to draw a stencil of white versus black. White for the sky, black for the adobe building in that case. I have the exact same thing here. And so to clean it up, I can use that exact same process. I'll switch to the brush tool, and I'll make sure that my foreground color in this case is set to black. I can press D for the default colors, and then X to exchange or swap the foreground and background colors. And then I'll paint with black. Very, very easy in this case. Thankfully, I chose an image where there weren't too many white specks right up near the horizon where I have to zoom in and be careful. Pretty straightforward. If I had any spots, any dark spots up in the sky, then I could just paint with white and clean those up, but it looks like we've got a nice clean sky there. So that worked out very nicely indeed. And now I'm ready to just create a selection. Remember that luminosity trick? When we use the threshold command, then I loaded a selection very quickly and easily. Same process right here down at the bottom of the channels panel. I can click on that load channel as selection button to load a selection. At the moment, it's a selection of the sky. Obviously, I could use that inverse command if I want to invert it to be a selection of the foreground rather than the sky. And then if I go back and click on my RGB tile up at the top of the channels panel, I'm back to my full color image and I have my amazingly accurate selection as part of that process. It's hard to believe it's true, isn't it? Something so impressive could work so well. And yet, you're going to find situations that are going to be tricky, that are going to be challenging and complicated. Uh, and in some of those, you, number one, you're going to find that you need to do a lot of work to clean things up, potentially. But you might also find another technique works nicely as far as being the foundation of some of that work. So I'm going to start off with the magic wand tool here. And we'll just try to create a selection, hopefully a reasonably accurate selection of the sky. So again, just uh, frankly, 
I could increase the value for threshold, but rather than kind of messing around with that, I have a tendency to prefer just getting in there and shift clicking a variety of times, holding the shift key and clicking in various areas of the sky to add those areas to my selection. But I'm also going to intentionally make a mistake. Yes, of course, you thought it would never happen, but I'm going to make a mistake right here in the middle. We'll just pretend like the magic wand tool didn't do a very good job and I missed it. Because I want to show you some ways that we can clean up the selection, which is hopefully really accurate but notice I have these areas. So the magic wand tool is trying to sample these areas of the image, and we can see where the sky is selected versus the leaves are not selected. But also notice these dark areas in between the leaves. They're not selected either, at least they don't appear to be. Remember, the selection outline is showing us that 50% split between at least versus not 50% selected, or greater than or less than 50% selected. But one of the tricks that I can use, one of the techniques that I can use to help me evaluate and refine my selection is quick mask mode. Now very often, before I would go to quick mask mode, I would just go ahead and make my layer mask and go clean things up there. But that's the subject of a different presentation that I might give at some point in the future at the B&H event space. Uh, so instead, I'll just use quick mask mode to clean things up. Now quick mask mode, it basically allows me to paint rather than trace, which is a subtle distinction, but it also provides me with a preview of the actual selection shape. So if I press the letter Q, as in quick mask mode, on the keyboard, that will switch me into quick mask mode versus pressing it again takes me back to normal selection mode. Now if I, the button is hidden here for uh, the moment on my display, but if I expand to a two column toolbox, then you'll see that I have this little layer mask button. That is my quick mask mode button. So I can toggle as opposed to pressing the letter Q on the keyboard, but also I can adjust the options. Now at the moment, the red overlay that is the default, it's working wonderfully well because there's no red in this picture. I've got lots of yellows and greens and blues and whatnot, but nothing red. And so this doesn't create a problem for me. But what if it was a red rose that was set against a green background? Now suddenly it's a little more difficult to see where the image is selected versus not. If I double click on the quick mask mode button, that will bring up my quick mask options dialog. And I can choose, number one, do I want the color to appear in areas that are not selected or that are selected? So do I want the selection over the masked areas, that's the default, or do I want the color to appear on the selected areas? To me, mask, the, you know, the, the color overlay, that means not selected. That's what's stuck in my head, so I don't like to change it, but if you want to, you certainly can. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, the color itself. So I want to choose a color that's really easy to see in the context of the image that I'm currently working with. So in some cases, maybe blue would work well. Obviously not for this image, but in some cases that might be good, or some bright shade of green, or magenta, or red. Here, red was working perfectly fine, but the point is that I can pick and choose. I can change the color if it's not working for a particular job that I'm working with. So I can click OK to just accept those changes, and then once again, switching back and forth into versus out of quick mask mode in order to be in quick mask mode versus regular selection mode. Now remember, with, for example, the lasso tool, I'm tracing around to define my selection. Quick mask mode is you know, similar in the sense that I'm still defining a shape, but now, ooh, I really got my, made my work uh, difficult here. Uh, but here, I'm just gonna paint with black or white instead. It's sort of like working with the layer mask, ultimately. So I'm gonna use the brush tool, and I will paint with black in areas that I want to have the color in. In other words, not selected or blocked in terms of the final adjustment. And I can paint with white in areas that I want to be selected, to be affected by my ultimate adjustment or whatever it might be. And of course, having made things really difficult on myself because I have this big, huge area that I chose to deselect, so now I have a lot of work to do. And I don't like that. But I should have thought about that before I made such a big area not included in my selection. But you can see here, as I'm painting with white, I'm essentially revealing the underlying image. I'm getting rid of that quick mask overlay and including those areas now in the selection. So if I switch back, you'll see that I'm expanding my selection. Now, obviously, I could use other techniques to you know, kind of fine tune this. I could use a really, really small brush because we want that branch to be included, right? So if I go back into quick mask mode, I can paint with black just on the tiny little branch because I want this to be just the most amazingly perfect selection that anybody has ever seen because y'all are watching. 
right? So I can paint with black to deselect to add the overlay or paint with white to erase the overlay, which is adding that area to the selection. Now, with this big, huge area that I've added for illustrative purposes, obviously that's gonna be a lot of work. Where this is generally more useful is for some of the little smaller areas. So for example, here, I have this bright spot that obviously was interpreted as being part of the sky, but really it's part of the tree. It's maybe a leaf that's just real shiny because of the angle of the sun. And so I might want to exclude that little area. Keeping in mind, by the way, that I'm using the brush tool. And the brush tool includes a hardness setting. So I can have variable hardness for different areas of the image as I'm painting which means I can have variable feathering. So this can be really, really helpful, especially when I'm planning on a fairly strong adjustment for the image. So hopefully this is all looking pretty good. You know, there's little tidbits here and there. You know, maybe I want to add that little leaf back in and that back in, et cetera, et cetera. So I can get really super detail-oriented. And many photographers find this approach to be a lot easier than tracing because you're just painting over an object, going right up to the edge, rather than trying to precisely trace. Even though the ultimate shape is basically the same, it can be a little bit easier to just paint, especially if you're using a, like a stylus, like a Wacom tablet, as opposed to a mouse, because you can be a little bit more precise. So by virtue of using that quick mask mode, we're actually modifying the underlying selection. You can switch back and forth. I could use the quick selection tool to clean up a certain area while I'm in selection mode, then switch back to quick mask mode and use the paintbrush tool in order to clean up those additional areas, et cetera, until it is absolutely perfect. And then a macaque shows up. and we decide we need to make a selection of the macaque, which presents all sorts of problems, very few of which I'm going to solve today, because I just want to show you one additional little tidbit here. If we were going to composite this, I would need to take into account the translucency of the fur and whatever new background I might be putting this macaque on. We'll save that for another presentation. I'm going to start off, though, with my channel-based selection technique. So I'll go find which channel represents the best starting point for this image. In this case, I think it's, once again, the blue channel. And so I'll drag that to the Create New Channel button, the blank sheet of paper icon down at the bottom of the Channels panel. And then I will go to Enhance Contrast with a Levels Adjustment. And what I want to do is make the macaque white and the background black. And what I'll quickly discover is that that's impossible. And furthermore, if I apply enough of a contrast enhancement that I have reasonable separation between the macaque and the background, guess what happens to my fur detail? It just starts to get obliterated. So if I expand this out, you see the fur that's still there. And so I want to be really careful about that fur detail in particular. And try not to worry too much about everything in between. So maybe something like that, which seems to be not a very good starting point at all. Typically, of course, I'm choosing images that work remarkably well for any given technique. This one might be a little bit of a struggle, but that's why we're here, is to solve that issue. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply that change. And you'll recall, when we had the field of yellow flowers versus blue sky, I ended up with some white spots down in the lower area of the image, and I could just paint with black to fix that. I can do the exact same thing here. I'll grab my brush tool, make sure I'm painting with black, increase my brush size, and look at this. Just very simply erase all of those areas. Oh. Oh. Haircut. Hmm. Now what? With the added pressure of essentially being on live TV with potentially millions of people watching right this very moment, wondering how we're going to get out of this little fix. Fortunately, I studied ahead, so we're good. We're going to dodge and burn. So I've got these areas. If I paint with black, I obliterate fur detail. If I paint with dodging and burning, I can still damage fur detail, but to a much lesser extent. And that dodging and burning, if you're familiar with the technique that I like to use for dodging and burning in general, it involves the use of the overlay blend mode, one of the contrast blend modes, where we can paint with a dark value to darken, or paint with a light value to lighten, without impacting black or white specifically. And so, 
Now you see I can paint. I didn't quite get all of that, but that's all right. And as I come into the fur detail, I'm still going to alter the fur detail, but I'm not losing all of the detail. So I'm kind of giving them a, just a little trim, not a full haircut, not a buzz cut. And then, of course, I can come back and paint in some of those additional areas. I'm going to zoom out here. You've seen the close-up effect, right? So I'm not going to worry about matching that every single position. I'm just going to go zoomed out here so you don't need to see every little detail as I'm cleaning things up. And I don't need to clean up the entire image. I just need a path around the macaque so that I'll have something to work with when it comes to cleaning things up. Then. I'll switch my foreground color to white. So remember, I can press the letter D on the keyboard to get the defaults of black and white. And then I can press the letter X to exchange, to switch back and forth between those. And so now I'll press X to switch to white. Same basic concept, except now I'm lightening areas of the image. And once again, I don't need to fill in the entirety of the interior of my macaque. I just need a little bit of a path to work with. So I just need a little bit of a kind of racetrack around that edge, which I'll use as the basis of some cleanup work. Bearing in mind that I'm not really paying any attention to that stump that he's sitting on down at the bottom, because that's going to be pretty easy to clean up with other techniques. So I don't need to go to all this trouble for that wooden block, essentially, that I can use other tools, a quick selection tool, for example, to very easily clean up. So now it doesn't look like I've made very much progress, and yet I've made a tremendous amount of progress, and I can very easily clean up the rest of this mask. I'm going to switch to a tool that we haven't looked at yet, the polygonal lasso tool. It's hiding underneath the lasso tool, so once again, I could right click or click and hold on the lasso tool button to bring up that fly out, and then choose the polygonal lasso tool. I'll start with the interior just because conceptually that's a little bit easier. I'm just gonna click up near the top of his head, and then I'll click to add anchor points. I'm essentially drawing a polygon. I don't even need to be all that careful. I'm not gonna worry at all. Let me zoom out just a little tiny bit here. I'm not gonna worry about the stump down below. I'll just clean that up with other methods. But as much as possible, I just wanna get the interior of the macaque completely selected. So that path that I created for myself just inside the edge of the fur, that's what I'm using to create this selection. And now I'm going to fill this selected area with white. White happens to be my foreground color. So yet another keyboard shortcut for those of you that want to collect them all. If I hold the Alt key on Windows, Option key on Macintosh, and press the Delete key, that will fill with the foreground color. So then Control D, Command D to deselect. And look at that, a perfect or nearly perfect macaque shape. And then I need the exterior portion of the image as well. Same basic process. So I'll start above and outside the macaque in this case. And I just want to trace around the outer edge. So basically as close to the macaque as I can get comfortably where all of the clutter, all of the mess is to the outside. Once I get to the outer edge of the image, now I don't want to go around the macaque. I need to go back around the other way so that I'm selecting all of that exterior portion. So I'll just move around the exterior of the image, outside of the actual image, and then come back in on the other side of the macaque and go back to my initial starting point and click. So now I have the outer, that black area, essentially, of the image selected. Another keyboard shortcut. I want the background color to be used as fill. So now Control or Command with the back, uh, with a delete button, well, backspace on Windows. And there you have it. I know the millions watching live at home are applauding in front of their computers right now. It's very impressive, isn't it? And once again, we can load that then as a selection. So with that load channel as selection button, and I can click on the RGB tile, and now I have a selection of more or less the macaque. Now, obviously, I mentioned that area down below, so I might use my quick selection tool, for example, to add that stump back in, but that's a pretty easy task. And otherwise, a pretty good selection that preserves the fur detail for the macaque itself. So I might apply a targeted adjustment. Maybe I wanted to, for example, darken up the background area a little bit, or you know, whatever the case might be. But point being is that I now have a pretty darn good selection. Now, there is the potential if I were creating a composite, I put the macaque onto a different background. We're going to have some of that color bleeding through as translucent fur. Uh, that would be a different issue to contend with. But the point being is that we're able to make a pretty darn accurate selection, even with all of that fur detail, thanks to dodging and burning, essentially, on a channel, on a, an alpha channel that's being used as the basis of a selection. 
Aw, I mean, it's no Fallon, but it's still a cute horse, isn't it? So I'm going to show you, uh, think of this more as like just potential. This is potential. Remember I talked about how I would create a basic selection and then really work to fine tune it later when I'm working with my layer mask for the targeted adjustment or for my composite image. I usually won't spend a huge amount of effort cleaning up a selection because I can't see the actual final result. But the exact same techniques that I'm going to show you right now can also be used in the context of a layer mask rather than a selection. Since we're talking about selections today, I thought I would just use it, demonstrate it in that context. So I'm just going to create a selection. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can probably already appreciate a valuable lesson in photography. If you do not want to have any difficulty when it comes to creating selections, then you should never photograph subjects that have hair, feathers, or fur. <laughs> if you just take that little piece of advice all by itself, it will save you hours of frustration. All right, so we have what looks to be a pretty good selection here, <laughs> especially if we don't zoom in. <laughs> And take a look at that, uh, the mane, that nice, I, I don't know, whoever does this horse's hair, obviously very <laughs> talented with a curling iron. So if I want to apply an adjustment to this image, I would need to clean things up a little bit. And again, normally I would save this mask cleanup work for later once I've applied my adjustment. But just to illustrate the concept, we have the select and mask mode. This select and mask mode is available both for a layer mask and for a selection. So I'm demonstrating it in the context of a selection, but you could also use this directly in the context of your final effect with a layer mask. And there's a few things here that are pretty amazing. So for starters, I might not have a perfect selection to start with. We're not going to worry about that because we all agree we're friends, right? <laughs> and so some of this might be less than perfect, but you'll get the idea here. First off, we want some feathering. And so I can increase the value of feathering, and you see that I get that kind of fuzzy edge, that transition which is already helpful. I also, though, let me scroll down a little bit, can shift that edge. So you'll notice we saw a similar example with the flower petal that was fading off into the greenery in the background. And here, the rump of our horse here, it kind of blends from the brown fur into the green background. And so it can be obviously a little challenging, and we saw an example of that earlier. But I can also shift that edge inward or outward. And so, I don't know how well you can see if we zoom. Can you see it up there? No. If you watch it bounce, we'll zoom in a little bit further. So we zoom out, or we uh, shift inward versus outward, and you see that edge bouncing around. So I can try to get that edge positioned as perfectly as possible based on the specific transition that I have within the image. So feather and shift edge can be incredibly helpful in a large number of situations when it comes to that selection or the layer mask. Contrast you don't need. You know why you don't need it? Because you never feathered the selection in the first place. You saved it for later, just like I do. And so you don't need contrast. Contrast is the opposite of feathering. So if later you decide you've applied too much feathering, just increase the value for contrast, and it'll tighten up that transition. But if you save your feathering for later in your workflow, then you won't have to worry about it at all. But then we get to the good stuff. I'm feeling so nervous right now. So we can increase our value for radius. So this is our edge detection section. I can also use a smart radius. The idea there is that I can increase the value for radius the size, if you will, of the area that is being evaluated in terms of which should be selected versus not selected. And smart radius means if it's fuzzy, make it fuzzy. If it's crisp, make it crisp. It's just intelligent. It's pretty helpful. You can see it doesn't seem to have made much of an impact here on my actual fur detail. But then we have this little hand and brush tool over here. So that allows us to actually refine the edge. And this is the real magic. If I paint into these areas of fur within the image, oh my goodness. So granted, we're using a red overlay, that quick mask overlay. But if you'll notice, what's happening here is that some of the mane, the, the hair detail, fur or hair when it's a horse, I don't know. Yeah. But whatever that is, it's kind of shining through a little better. And these other areas of the image are being masked out. So I can even come into here 
and notice that it's sampling. There's little bits of sky that are peeking through or the, the ground, the hills in the background that are peeking through, and it's giving me translucency there. I can tell it to kind of reevaluate this area. And really what's happening is that as I'm painting, and you can see if I adjust that radius, we get a little bit of refinement in there. But as I'm painting, the image itself is being evaluated. In a manner of speaking, you can say it's saying, well, which is the main and which is the background based on my initial selection? And so by painting into these areas, I'm essentially telling Photoshop that I want it to refine that area of the image. Now, I can also simply paint. So I can add or subtract. So if I decide, look, I know that this is a little bit of sky showing through. But the sky color and the main color, they're practically the same. So let's just not worry about it. I can just subtract that area. Oops, I want to add it in this case because the selection is inverted. But I can add or subtract those areas to the image, uh, to the selection. So in this case, adding that area to the original selection as opposed to the masked areas of the image. And so by using a combination of those techniques, I can either essentially manually paint like quick mask mode or let Photoshop do the work of all of that, sort of like the quick selection tool, but with a little bit more intelligence behind it. And it can evaluate all of these areas of the fur detail to help extract as much of that as possible. And so you know, I can paint into some of this additional fur and try and pull some of that out. And it really, I mean, it's just remarkable. So we can add or subtract depending on whether we're building up areas of the selection versus breaking them down. And some of this, keep in mind, it's a little difficult to tell. So I'm using this overlay option in terms of seeing that quick mask mode preview of selected versus not selected. If I switch to on layers, I think you get a little bit better sense of all of that kind of wispy main detail. So I've got translucent areas of that main so that if I'm applying an adjustment, it's only affecting the main based on where the main is most dense. And if I'm putting this horse onto a completely different background, it's allowing part of that background to shine through the main because the main, don't forget, is going to be translucent. So I'm seeing some of that new color coming through. It's absolutely amazing. When I click OK, I end up with, of course, that marching ants display, keeping in mind that that marching ants display is just showing me the division between greater than or less than 50% selected. So it can be a little bit difficult to evaluate that. But going back into quick mask mode, I get a pretty good sense of the final effect. Quite impressive. Again, that is something that I would usually save for working on my actual layer mask as opposed to working on the initial selection. Oh my, I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but I am exhausted. And that was a lot of fun. So how many of you thought that was incredibly helpful? How many of you feel like your brain is fried? <laughs> Everybody. So that is really just selections. And I sort of joked at the beginning about how with selections, we're not really creating anything. We're not accomplishing anything. It's just one piece of the puzzle because we're now using that selection. And to actually do something, we need to either create a composite, so a layered image with a layer mask, or a targeted adjustment by virtue of an adjustment layer based on that selection. The layer mask will come along for the ride automatically. So selections, you know, they sort of get ignored a little bit by virtue of they're not really accomplishing anything all by themselves. And I've just scratched the surface. There's so much more that you can do with selections. There are additional selection tools that we didn't talk about, other techniques. Techniques. I did talk about all the favorite stuff, all the favorite things that I typically do with selections. But there's a lot more there as well. And then even more so when it comes to the targeted adjustments and composite imaging, what you're doing with those sele selections in terms of creating and then refining a layer mask. I often like to say, in Photoshop, you can do anything that you can imagine. It's just a question of figuring out how to actually accomplish that. Thank you guys very, very much. And I'll look forward to seeing you next time at the BNH Photo Event Space.